Welcome to Washington Post Live. I'm David Ignatius, a columnist for the Post. Today, my guest is Kaya Kallas, the Prime Minister of Estonia. We're going to be talking today about the crisis in her neighborhood as more than 100,000 Russian troops are lined up along the border of Ukraine. Uh, Madam Prime Minister, thank you very much for joining us this urgent moment for the West. Uh, welcome to Washington Post Live. Thank you for having me. So I, I want to just uh, remind our audience that if they would like to join in our conversation, please send us your questions or comments uh, to uh, Twitter at Washington Post Live. Uh, Madam, Madam Prime Minister, I want to start with the urgent question of the week. What is your latest information about what's happening at the Russia-Ukraine border? And what do you think is the likelihood that we'll see a Russian attack across that border this month? Well, uh, we see military buildup around Ukraine and also in, in Belarus uh, by, by Russian troops. Um, we also see uh, other indications that uh, Russia has plans to attack Ukraine. Whether they do or not is up to Kremlin to decide. Uh, so um, there are dialogue uh, kept uh, dialogue is kept with uh, with Russia in order to de-escalate the situation but uh, it's up to Kremlin to make the move to de-escalate because they have created this situation and can only back up from this as you know we're now in the moment uh, of diplomacy seeking to explore whether there's a way to de-escalate the the crisis what Winston Churchill uh, generations ago called jaw jaw, not war war. Uh, today, uh, Secretary of State uh, Antony Blinken is talking by phone to Russian Foreign Minister Sergei Lavrov. Lavrov said after receiving the U.S. written response to Russian demands that he saw uh, a kernel of rationality was the phrase that Lavrov used. I'm curious what you think is going on in this diplomatic moment and whether you think there's any real possibility of a diplomatic settlement that would be acceptable? Well, uh, I think the allies are doing a great job in keeping Russia at the table. Um, it's not negotiations, but uh, rather a dialogue with uh, Russia. Uh, but, uh, but again, it's nothing that NATO or, or the West can really offer to Russia to de-escalate because NATO hasn't created the situation. NATO hasn't, hasn't uh, uh, or is not planning to attack anybody. Uh, so it's up to Russia to decide. Of course, the question is, what brings them out of the corner where they are uh, currently? Uh, so, uh, what are the you know the elements that they could say that okay, uh, this is now off the table? But it's up to them to decide. Uh, I think um, you know the West should not fall into this trap that we are offering them something that they didn't have before, because of course Russia is making all this outrageous demands. Um, you know, making demands regarding NATO's. Um, uh, alliance, uh, NATO's allies who can be members of NATO and not saying that uh, NATO should go, go back to its 97 uh, borders, which means that half of the NATO members should not be NATO members. It's not up to Russia to say. But also, uh, you know, claiming that uh, uh, there should be a limitation regarding military exercises close to NATO's borders. Um, 
you know, I'm just reminding everybody that uh, NATO is a defense alliance. NATO is not planning to attack anybody. If we agree with Russia on, you know, limitation of uh, military exercises, it means that uh, that uh, we can't have military exercises on our soil, but uh, it is detrimental to our uh, defense posture um, here being uh, geographically very close to Russia and being uh, geographically uh, as a peninsula uh, when it comes to NATO. Prime Minister, let me ask you to be specific about that. There has been discussion about limits on military exercises as one uh, possible compromise. Your country is a place that would be affected by those limits because, as you say, NATO exercises in Estonia. I understand you to, to be saying that you'd be flatly opposed to making any concession on this issue of exercises. Am I reading you right? Uh, absolutely, because as I say, you know, uh, Russia's aim is to get the g agreement with, uh, with the West or with NATO, uh, but uh, Russia has not kept the agreements before. Um, Antony Blinken said in his speech in, in Berlin very well, pointing out that uh, Ukraine made this uh, agreement regarding nuclear arsenal uh, being the fourth biggest uh, nuclear, nuclear um, arsenal they had um, previously. And how would you know the citizens of Crimea or Donbas look at this agreement right now because it clearly worked as a deterrence that is not there anymore. So Russia's aim is to get the agreement but the West, uh, you know, being all the democracies that we are, the countries, um, we are also bound by these agreements. If we make agreements, we want to keep the agreements. Uh, you know, the principle Bakta und Servanda is uh, very dear to, you know, the uh, Western world. Uh, and so we have a situation where, you know, we have the agreement and Russia is not keeping his side of the agreement and the West is. And, and our defense is based on two pillars. One is our own defense, our own army, that we are investing more than 2% of our GDP too. And the other pillar is the collective uh, defense of NATO. So, you know, the Article 5 of NATO um, saying that attack on one is attack on all. Uh, it is one of our, you know, basic pillars. If we don't have military exercises, we can't really exercise what we would do uh, in our defense, and that would be detrimental to our security. You've been very tough, uh, Prime Minister, in cautioning against making uh, concessions to Russia uh, to de-escalate this crisis. I'm wondering what you think as you uh, read of, uh, hear briefings about uh, French President Macron uh, making two calls in the last week to, to Putin, Viktor Orban uh, of Hungary, a, a NATO member uh, going off to Moscow to conduct his, his his own diplomacy. Do you worry that NATO's unity is becoming uh, uh, damaged uh, by these efforts to, to seek special uh, contact with Putin? Well, uh, I think, first of all, it is uh, very important that the NATO's unity has been very strong in this case. And we have been coordinating with the allies and everybody has given the same message to Russia, that Russia does not have a say who can and who cannot be members of NATO and how NATO really conducts its uh, defense on, on NATO's, uh, NATO's allies' soil. So, so the line has been very, very clear. There might be differences in, in tactics and, of course, we have never been against the dialogue with Russia, keeping them at the table, um, having a you know, solution to this that Russia wouldn't escalate this situation even, even further. I think this is all, all good, while the overall principle, the overall um, uh, uh, unity is, is still in place. And, and what has to be kept in mind is that Russia really wants to see us divided, whereas, you know, it shouldn't be in our interest. I mean, the, all uh, NATO's allies. Our uh, strength is unity and we have to keep this. And so far we have kept this. And it has become as a negative surprise to Russia that we have been so united. Speaking uh, about this issue of uh, the uh, 
at least small differences of opinion. Um, we'll see how small they are within uh, this alliance. Uh, President Zelensky of Ukraine, the person at the eye of this storm, said last Friday that he worried that the United States uh, and some NATO allies were making too much of Russia's buildup and were creating unnecessary panic. And I wonder, what's your response to President Zelensky's comment? What you have to understand is that um, he, being the leader of the country, has to have this uh, balance. On, on one side, uh, you know, the fear of war drives away investments and is detrimental to the economy of Ukraine. And, and on the other side, they clearly see the military buildup around their uh, borders. What uh, Ukraine has seen for the last eight years, because they have already been in the war with Russia for the last eight years. So maybe, you know, for them, it's, it's, uh, you, they see this all the time. But I think uh, he just wants to balance uh, in between those two interests saying that uh, this uh, um, situation is, is grave and the intentions that we see uh, that Russia is, is building up and, and showing uh, in, in, in all, the, all the channels are severe and at the same time, uh, you know, uh, keep the economy uh, running and, and uh, people not panicking. So, so the balance has to be there. Before we leave uh, the question of, of diplomacy, I want to ask you whether you think there is a way to address President Putin's desire for greater security. Every country wants to have secure borders without making the kinds of compromises that are inappropriate. Do, do you see any um, ideas that, that might be useful as the diplomats discuss some exit ramp, as they say, from this crisis? Well, uh, it's it's a good question, but uh, we have to understand uh, the the point where we have been. I mean, the starting point of this uh, crisis. First of all, it is that uh, Russia is is putting this or creating this military buildup around Ukraine, and then presenting ultimatums. Uh, I've already quoted this several times, but uh, you know, it reminds me of the negotiation tactics of the former Soviet Union uh, Foreign Minister uh, Alexei Kramuko, who said basically three things. One is that demand the maximum, do not meekly ask, but demand. Second is that present ultimatums, and and you know, this is also something that they are doing. And third is that do not give one inch in negotiations, because there will always be people in the West who will offer you something and in the end you will have already a third or even a half of something you didn't have before. So, so this, is, uh, this is the situation and we have to keep this in mind uh, because when, uh, when there are discussions what could the West offer uh, in order to de-escalate then they already have something that they didn't have before. But, uh, but when I'm saying this that of course you know um, there could be, could be, uh, for example, the transparency of the military exercises. We could agree to that. Uh, but again, the problem is that uh, Russia is usually not keeping their side of the promise or their side of the agreement. So what, it, what is the use? Um, you know, um, the positive side might be that uh, Russia has not walked from the table right now and the uh, dialogue is, is going on uh, with NATO, but we have to be very, very careful that we don't give away something that they didn't have before. So I want to turn to the question of what military uh, preparations Estonia and other NATO members should be making now. You, uh, your government, has, has pledged that Estonia will send uh, dozens of anti-tank missiles to Ukraine to aid them in their defense. It's a crucial weapon. Uh, I'm, I'm wondering if those anti-tank missiles have arrived and whether you'll send more uh, if Ukraine actually is attacked. Uh, and more generally, Prime Minister, I want to ask, if Russian forces go over that border, you know, tomorrow or two weeks from now, whenever it might happen, what would Estonia do immediately in response? 
First, uh, first of all, we are thinking about our own defense as well. So uh, just two weeks ago, we made a decision um, in our government to uh, increase our defense spending. And we currently are spending over 2.4% of our GDP on defense. So that, you know, it's not only um, collective defense of uh, NATO allies, but it's also our own army that is stronger. It's uh, just uh, not that we see military threat behind our borders right now, but it's, uh, it's always better to prepare. Like the saying goes, um, in order to live in peace, you have to prepare for war. Uh, the other thing what we are doing is helping Ukraine in all possible means that we can. Uh, of course, we are a small country. We are only 1.3 million people, but we try to do uh, what we can because we clearly understand uh, what it means to, you know, lose your independence. And and for Ukraine, there is a clear threat for that, and we want to help them with, uh, you know, military capabilities that we can, but also uh, political tools, uh, communication, um, all all the tools that uh, that a small country uh, can really uh, give to Ukraine. Uh, it's it's been reported, Prime Minister, that in, in addition to the anti-tank missiles that I mentioned before. Estonia and other Baltic nations are, are supplying stingers, which, as we know from the Afghanistan war, can be crucial if there's a drawn out insurgency. Is that report accurate or are you sending stingers to, to Ukraine? Well, I wouldn't go into details uh, about the uh, the concrete capabilities, but I'm, I'm saying that uh, we are doing what we can, uh, and and we are helping Ukraine with the with the capabilities that we can, uh, keeping in mind that we also have to strengthen our own defense at the same time. Uh, Germany uh, has taken a, a slightly different view about supplying weapons to Ukraine, and uh, last week, as as I've read the news. Germany blocked Estonia from transferring some advanced howitzers that it was planning to send to Ukraine. I want to ask two questions. First, were you able to circumvent that German blockade the way the British did in sending weapons uh, to Ukraine? And, and second, do you worry that Germany's position on arms transfers is undermining the unity of NATO that you spoke of earlier as being so important? Every country has the right to decide how they help or whether they help uh, Ukraine. And and so does Germany. I, I wouldn't go into German uh, internal politics of how they make decisions and, and what kind of uh, consents they give. Uh, it's up to them to decide. Um, for us, it is important to help Ukraine, and uh, that is the message that we are uh, giving. But um, we haven't received the official response from Germany yet, so I, I, I cannot uh, confirm uh, that this is uh, this is their final uh, final answer to to our help. But I take it you've requested that you be able to transfer those weapons. Well, yes, we have uh, agreement with uh, Germany because we have received those um, from Germany that if we give them, uh, we have to get the consent. And so so it's up to them to decide. But uh, to your other question, what was about the unity, then still, I think the overall um, clear messages that uh, that the NATO has given uh, and all the members of NATO have given to Russia regarding this saying that, you know, also on the European Union level, we will put sanctions, uh, extremely severe sanctions, if uh, if Russia escalates the situation even further. And also, uh, you know, that NATO is not giving in uh, in all of those uh, demands. I think those messages have been very clear. I want to ask Prime Minister about a crucial uh, a part of this conflict and one that Estonia has special insight into, and that is the use of disinformation and cyber weapons. Um, uh, one of our viewers, Philip, in California, has sent us a question that I, I want to pose to you. Based on ex Estonia's experience with the use of disinformation and cyber weapons uh, in the past, I believe in 2007 was the first time you were attacked, 
what have you learned that would be helpful to Ukraine? What advice would you offer them about how to be resilient in the face of a Russian electronic disinformation cyber attack that you, your country has experienced? Well, considering that uh, all those cyber um, attacks uh, really evolve in time or, or they develop, um, you are always one step behind. Uh, yes, in 2007, we experienced this uh, cyber attack and we learned from this. And now we have the NATO's Cybersecurity Center of Excellence in Estonia and we try to, you know, prepare for different uh, cyber attacks. Uh, there are um, exercises uh, that are actually very, very interesting uh, that we prepare for. What, it, what comes to information war, I think, um, you know, we don't, uh, none of us have enough tools to fight those. Um, you know, uh, in when Crimea happened, um, then everybody was expecting also the cyber attacks to uh, follow. But uh, what followed was a propaganda war, really. Uh, you know, uh, false information picked up by uh, uh, one of leading newspapers, and then it was published all over the world. And it was very hard to turn back. And what, what it really uh, aimed at was the democracies and how we how the democracies make decisions. It's up to, you know, public opinion um, and, and the uh, people in the government are very much influenced how, how the public sees these things. So if you can create a mess, in the um, information uh, sphere uh, or the public opinion, then it's very hard to uh, render decisions. And, uh, and this is something that, that we uh, see here and will see here as well. Um, we have more such hybrid conflicts, more, um, you know, smaller uh, conflicts uh, that can, you know, uh, put together the bigger picture. So um, we are never, uh, totally ready for what is coming, uh, considering the capabilities that uh, Russia also has in the cyber sphere. But what is also interesting, uh, just one, one additional point, we were also part of the uh, UN Security Council for two years, and I was chairing uh, the first ever uh, cyber uh, security uh, uh, discussion in the UN Security Council. And what was interesting about this was that uh, everybody else agreed that, um, you know, international law should also apply in the cyberspace, whereas, you know, Russia and China were, were not that strong on this point. And, and I, I guess we know why. And just a, a small point, but I, I'd like to clarify it for our viewers. Are your cyber experts who are among the most skilled uh, in the world, are they currently in Ukraine helping the Ukrainians uh, develop better resiliency? Uh, well, uh, we are helping Ukraine uh, with all the tools that we can get and we are, uh, we have very many uh, good connections and, uh, and expertise that we share uh, with the Ukrainians uh, on, on every level, yes. So uh, let me ask you uh, about uh, forward deployments in Estonia by uh, NATO uh, uh, forces. Last week, six U.S. F-15 fighters um, are said to have de deployed, been sent uh, uh, to to Estonia. Um, uh, tell us about that. Whether they're still there, and do you expect the United States and other NATO countries to make additional uh, forward deployments? in the event that Russia invades Ukraine as a, as a signal uh, to Moscow and also to, to make sure that your defense is secure? Well, uh, one, uh, one of the basic principles uh, of, of our defense is the collective defense of NATO. So, so it acts or is based on the defense and deterrence posture. Uh, we built the defense, but we also built the deterrence. So when our allies are here in the enhanced forward presence, um, uh, the troops are here, then it's clearly um, a deterrent uh, factor for Russia because as Article 5 goes, attack on one is attack on all. Uh, and when you have, um, you know, the troops are present here, like the 
Brits are in Estonia um, and uh, Canadians are in Latvia, for example, then it clearly acts as a deterrent. Uh, we have very good contacts with our allies. We have been talking um, last years about strengthening the eastern flank of NATO, and it's it's not related to this Ukrainian crisis. But we have been uh, saying uh, this for for some time already, and I'm I'm happy to uh, see that uh, this is going forward as well. Um, that the eastern flank needs to be strengthened, and our allies are with us. Let me ask you, Prime Minister, about, about the energy politics part of this crisis. You said uh, last week very forthrightly that Germany should uh, understand that Nord Stream, the Nord Stream pipeline, is a geopolitical project, not simply an economic one. And you went on to say that if you're connected to someone, then the person on the other side of the connection can hurt you. And you made clear that you thought the Nord Stream pipeline could be destabilizing for European security. Uh, I'm wondering whether you're concerned that Germans are not yet taking this danger, which you were so explicit in describing, seriously enough. Well, we have been saying this from the start of this project, uh, that uh, it's a geopolitical project, not an economical one. So this is no surprise to our Western allies. We have been saying this all along. And when we have now the energy crisis, the energy prices going up in all of the uh, European member states, for example, then uh, there are also voices uh, within Europe saying that um, you know, um, the, um, the increase in the energy prices or electricity prices is related to the gas price and the gas comes from Russia um, or the dependence on, on the gas coming outside Europe is, is uh, too, too big. So um, this is detrimental to the economy of uh, uh, European countries and also it means that um, you know, it can be a destabilizing factor for all the countries. What we see here, people are very, very angry at the uh, rising electricity prices, but um, the rising electricity prices are related to the price of gas. So, so I think it has become clear that uh, um, you should really uh, pick your trading partners in a, in a sense that uh, uh, they might also hurt you if they, their intentions are not economical, uh, but uh, geopolitical. I want to ask you how you would uh, rate uh, President Biden's uh, leadership in this in this crisis. He has been criticized by some for a comment at a press conference where he initially suggested that a minor incursion uh, might dr not draw a, a strong response. He later revised that the next day. Uh, more recently, President Zelensky, as I mentioned earlier in our conversation, suggested that he thought Biden was overreacting. Really curious um, what your own assessment would be of how well the Biden administration as a whole has handled this crisis as, as you've been watching policy unfold. We are a small country, uh, as I said, uh, being a NATO peninsula, uh, um, if, uh, if you look at the map. And for us, uh, it is very important that we are being consulted with and, and uh, there is very tight cooperation between the allies and not only the big ones, but also also those affected in the eastern flank. So, uh, so we are very grateful for that. Uh, we understand that it takes a lot of effort to consult with everybody. But, uh, but uh, we feel that uh, we are also uh, heard uh, in, in this process and it means a great deal to us. So I, I should understand you to be saying that from Estonia's standpoint, the fact you've been consulted so extensively by the, by the United States is a plus for, for uh, how you'd assess President Biden's handling. Well, uh, of course, we haven't been in this kind of situation before, um, in this uh, very tense uh, situation that we see unfolding, but uh, 
we clearly see the wish and uh, um, you know the efforts that the uh, Biden administration is doing uh, in order to keep us on board and and to you know give us the insurance that nothing is agreed about us without us. So I want to ask you a, a final question. Um, uh, pull the camera back a bit from the, the events of, of, of today and ask you whether you think President uh, Putin, whatever happens in the next several weeks, will emerge from this crisis stronger or weaker? What's your guess? Well, um, it uh, it of course depends whether we we look at the you know the in uh, internal politics of of Russia or the outer world. Um, so um, I mean, just uh, I think a year back I wrote uh, I I read the book uh, Dictator's Handbook, <laughs> and so if you if you take this by the measures of the Dictator's Handbook, so dictator needs to sh show strength, and any step back is not showing uh, strength. So um, the only way is uh, for them to to escalate. But uh, I think in the Western world. Um, you know, compromising shows also strength uh, or stepping back uh, and and keeping uh, all the interests uh, or understanding also the other countries' interests is also considered strength. So it depends on which side you, you look at this question. So uh, Prime Minister Kaya Kallas of, of Estonia, thank you for a discussion of all the issues that are involved in this crisis. We really appreciate your coming to, to join us at Washington Post Live. Thank you, All the best. So uh, thanks for, for watching today's uh, special uh, discussion of the Ukraine crisis. To check out what interviews we've got coming up, and we have a lot of really good ones, uh, please head to WashingtonPostLive.com to register and to find uh, more information about our upcoming programs. We love to hear from you, our audience, if you want to send us comments or questions uh, for speakers that we've got uh, coming ahead. Uh, thanks very much for joining us today.